Okay, good. Good. So um, what I'll do is I'm just going to share my other screen and talk through things on that. Um, but yeah, this is uh, it's a talk on Devil's Dyke. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an expanded site guide, effectively. I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. One, I, I'm trying to put together an entire series of video site guides. I know you've got like the PDF version of it, um, but it seems to help for people to be able to have this. So we can go into a lot more detail and go over it again. And, you know, and a PDF isn't always the best media for a lot of people. And something that's a bit more interactive like this can sometimes be helpful. It was also prompted by a couple of incidents on the same day at Devil's Dyke. And so part of what we'll look at is, um, is airflow there, how wind directions affect the flying, you know, where it's safe to fly. And also we'll look at how to progress your flying there, how to go from just ridge soaring in the small bit to extending it along the ridge to pushing out and, you know, go with questions on that. So I'm just going to share my other screen. It should be that one. Okay, so hopefully you can now see the screen. You should see Devil's Dark site guide up there. Um, so a few basics. If we start with the the wind rows, um, we'll see we've got Devil's Dyke in the you know, so the, in the sort of top left side of it. And it basically takes wind directions from north right the way around to west, northwest. The ideal wind direction is northwest because it's, uh, we'll have a look in a minute, but it's basically bang on the launch at that in that direction. As it goes either north, northeast, or northwest to west, it's going off the hill. Um, <clears throat> which means you're, you're not launching directly into the wind anymore. You're launching at an angle. The more it goes off the hill, um, the less lift you will get on the ridge because instead of the wind hitting the ridge directly, it's now hitting uh, the ridge at an angle. So it generates less lift as you're flying for, for ridge soaring. Um, it doesn't mean you can't fly. It just means it becomes harder and harder to do so. If we just say, look, at what I've done, I've used um, a mixture of Google Earth and some photos. Uh, I might use Google Earth. To, I've got it sitting there so we can look at it a bit more detail if need be. But I'll just bring this up initially. So this is Devil's Dyke. Um, <clears throat> the, you should see in the middle there, it's got National Trust Devil's Dyke with a little P on it. That's the pub, basically. That's where you park. Directly in front of that, you've, I've highlighted an area in green, and that's the main takeoff. Um, that whole section there is, is is pretty much where we launch from. As you come sort of down screen from that, you'll see I've got a section in red. Um, I, I put it in red because that's that's the paddock area below where the hang gliders launch from. So that as an area is kind of like your first major hazard in terms of landing and taking off basically if and i'll stress this right from the word go if there are hang gliders operating in the, in the main paddock area which is the bit uh, just above that red area then uh, you, you're basically trying to avoid that red area as much as possible if you have to land there because you have no other option then mushroom up walk to the top where you can see the hang gliders um, and if they're active, simply go back to the green, walk through the gate to the green area and launch from there. It's extremely hazardous if you are popping up wings with hang gliders launching behind you. Um, it, it, it can become lethal. It, inevitably, an accident's going to happen. You're going to hang gliders are going to go straight through a wing. It, it's just not pleasant. Um, even if you don't see a hang glider waiting to launch, if you're in that area. If, if they're about, it's the same principle, because if they're flying around, they're going to come into land. And if you're stood there, so you suddenly pop a wing up, they can't land. They're going to have to abort a landing. So it's I'm stressing at the moment because it, 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 it gets abused a bit. And it's just important to understand that, you know, if there's hang gliders there, 
and you land in that red area, mushroom, walk out. Um, if you keep going past the red area, we then get into the bowl. We've got the next green section, which is launching in the bowl. Um, and th those are primarily, those are our main sort of takeoff areas. Um, the arrows I've put on there, I probably shouldn't have had two blue arrows, but we'll go with that in a minute. Uh, the black arrow is essentially pointing north. And that's also pointing pretty much to where the landing area is in the bottom field. Um, but you can see if in a northerly wind just how off the hill it is. Even that is, you know, the 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 line is is starting to go across where you're taking off from. The the, the blue line in the middle is pretty much northwesterly. That's as you can see, it's kind of like bang on launch. That's your ideal direction. The other blue arrow coming from the side is westerly. Um, and you can see, so as that wind swings around, yeah, the lift's going to go completely. It's now going to be blowing uh, along the ridge. You're not going to get as much lift. Um, it, it really isn't the, the ideal. Well, you shouldn't fly in a westerly at all there. It's just not good. It's dangerous. Um, but let's take a look at this from a different angle. So this is looking um, obviously back towards the dike from like the sort of falking area. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the pub at the top. So again, I've, I've marked the same three areas out, red, green, sorry, green, red, green. Um, and it, it's, you can now start, you can see from this a bit more of the, the slope of the hill and how it works. Um, the other mate, the other sort of hazards to be aware of on the first green area is pretty much running along the bottom line of that green and the one between the green and the red is a barbed wire fence. Um, and barbed wire fences are obviously very hazardous to wings, hazardous to you. Um, if you go through them, they will generally rip damage and tear things. Um, they're not pleasant at all. I've seen enough people go through barbed wire fences and get wings shredded, legs shredded, all sorts of things like that. They're, they're horrendous. Um, and the, <laughs> so when you're there, you really should take a look at that and just make sure you know where they are. In particular, the one that's between the sort of the green and the red area, if the wind starts to go off a little bit to the north, then it, it's going to be basically when you launch, the tendency for you to drift in the direction of that red area. Um, and if you haven't given yourself enough, enough space, you're not far enough away from the fence and your ground handling isn't particularly good and your launching is not too good, it's very easy to find yourself actually being blown into the barbed wire fence between the two fields. Um, I've, again, I've seen many pilots go through that, get tangled in it, get dragged into it, um, just because they haven't seen what's happening with the wind. Uh, and you'll see it mentioned in the site guide as well. When it goes off to the north, Basically, you've got to the um, to the east of this green area, you have another bowl, we call it the Modeler's Bowl. And as the wind comes around to the north, you'll get a little bit of wind shadow effect. So you won't feel the full impact of the wing, the wind until you pop your wing up. Then it catches the airflow and you suddenly find yourself being hoofed in the direction of the fence. Um, so if it is going to the north, north light to northeast, make sure you've got plenty of space between you and that fence. Um, so you're not, you have like zero risk of going into it. Uh, the, um, I'm just going to take a look. So the other, I'm, I'm just going to just zoom out briefly. I'm just going to bring up uh, Google Earth for a second. There we go. Okay. This just gives like a slightly better overview and I can just draw a couple of things on here. Uh, so basically we've got, um, as I'll, in this area here is your main table. Um, and generally we're looking at 
you know, sort of wind, if the wind's on, you'll be banging to wind in this direction. So for a lot of people, the, your initial flying tends to be sort of launching from here and you're going to do this kind of circuit in this area. <clears throat> There's kind of an immediate hazard here, which is, um, and which you have to kind of adapt and get used to, which is when you are doing that circuit and you're in this section, <clears throat> You've got a, you know, when you're traveling, sorry, I'll just take it, clear it. So if you're going along the hill in this direction, then the ridge is on your left at this point. So you are obliged to give way to pilots that are coming back this way. So you have to push out of it. So when you get to, do that again. So when you get to this section in the bowl, you have a slightly funny loop that you have to do because you're approaching it with the ridge on your left and you're going to return with the ridge on your right. So you end up here with this, you're going to, you're coming down on your left and you can't turn into the hill. So notably you tend to get this, you sort of come around the bowl back and around this way. So you get this crossover in the bowl. Um, so as a hazard, <clears throat> you have to, you'll, you'll find that if there's not, when there's not a lot of separation, you can, you've got even just anywhere like five, five, six, seven, eight, even like less than 10 pilots in there. You need to coordinate and be like, really watch what happens in, uh, sorry, in, um, in this area because of that that loop over you're you're going from sort of one side to the other and you're inevitably crossing paths with other pilots um so just, just give yourself a bit of space be aware of that and just watch out for that as a sort of oddity in that area um <clears throat> so in terms of getting of like flying getting used to it the the obvious other hazards that are below takeoff you've got uh, you've got trees here and you've got this entire sort of lower section of trees down here given that the wind is coming in this direction um if you get at all low in this area, then you're coming in, you've got you've got trees here, you've got the wind coming this direction. If you're coming this way, you're gonna get rotor coming over the top of these trees. So you do not want to be getting um you know if if you're soaring here and you start to get a bit lower. And so people do this and they think they'll put, I'll just put one, I'll put one more beat in and they're not going up and they end up now they're hitting sink and they tend to end up doing something like this, <clears throat> heading directly into this area of rotor behind the trees. Um, it just gets really dangerous. So if you're in a situation where you're doing these beats, I would put the figure of eight in. You notice you're getting a bit low and you can't top land anymore or, or land above above the path. Just do this. Just literally fly straight out away from the hill. Um, <clears throat> because your landing field is this area down here. That's it. That's your target. So you just aim for it. And then you've got plenty of height to clear the trees. You've got no risk of rotor from them. And you've, you've set yourself up for an easy bottom landing. And the potential of maybe you'll find some lift where you've pushed away from the hill. Quite often, this area here, all right, 
this area around here is actually quite lifty and you'll often find thermals in this area which will actually get you back up and now you can come back to the ridge again um, <clears throat> Once you've kind of got used to flying this section, really the next thing you're looking at is coming around here. Um, I did with, with a view to, oops, ultimately with a view, your next sort of like big run is the Trudy run. Um, so this is, Devil's Dyke into the bowl around the corner. Uh, we've got here, I'll bring up another map in it, pylons. And then you pretty much have a ridge run all the way to Truly, which is over there. Um, and that's kind of going to be your first experience of a, if not gone XC, that's kind of like your first XC. Um, you know, it's a good right, it's about, I don't know three, three and a half kilometers, I think, to truly, so about seven there and back. Um, it's it's quite, it's slightly technical, but it, it's, it's a good run to do. And what you've got all the way along is this entire area at the bottom as a bomb out. So if it, if it goes wrong, you're not making it, you've got a wonderfully area of open ground, which you can land in. Um, so I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint again and talk a bit about the bowl. <laughs> so I just zoomed in on this bit of the bowl. This is kind of if you once you start going past the bowl and towards this, the clump of trees that sits on the top, and then you come back again. Um, this, you see the black line, I've got a sort of squiggly line above this clump of trees. Um, that clump of trees generates an amazing amount of rotor. And that squiggly line is kind of like reflecting the rotor that occurs behind it. If you are coming back from this area of the bushes, then if you're not on this top red, this top green line, your other option is to take the bottom green line and once again head the landing field. Trying to scoot along on this middle path on this black line inevitably takes you directly behind this clump of trees into this area of rotor. Um, and there is nowhere to go from that. You don't get there from it. All that happens is you just tend you just go on a you just hit rough air here. If you get through that you tend just to keep going down right into, into the base of the bowl in between the bushes, the trees and everything else. Um, but usually you just get, you just get dumped on the ground behind the trees with some speed. And it's one of the things that catches out, I suppose, almost every new pilot has not flown this area. But they come out to here, they, they, they push out to um, where the trees are. I'll just bring it back up Google Earth so I can draw a bit on that. So let's zoom in a bit. Okay, right. So here's the here's the trees. Um and what will happen is you're coming back, you've gone past them. You're coming along here. You don't get any lift. And so now you start to find you've got a little bit, so you're coming below this tree line. If that happens, do not, do not keep going around the corner. You will, you will just get drilled straight into this area here. You at this point, you, you just have to bail. You're basically going to go, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to clear that out. You've come around, you're getting a bit low, you just come out this way. Straight, you head straight for this field. Um, and again, it's not unusual as you go over the trees to actually find a bit of lift. 
And if you're lucky, you'll get back up. But worst case is you've got a very safe landing in the landing field. Um, let's pack up and move back up again. <clears throat> but it's very tempting to not, because people don't like to walk up, they tend to push. You know, they get to um, a bit off. They're coming back along here. It's a little bit low. Sometimes they'll put a turn in here. Never, very, it almost never works. So now you, now you're kind of really stuck because if you get to this point, you won't make it across the trees. You won't make it around the corner. You're now forcing yourself into what's usually a very tricky slope landing somewhere around here. <clears throat> so when you're taking this route and if you're not getting above these easy above these trees just do just take this route down it really is the safest option this is it's tricky slope landing here is very tricky um yeah just uh, just decide okay it doesn't work i'm going to go to the bottom if i get lucky i'll get some lift worst case is i'm just going to hike back up again all right um so the trudy run let's bring up my powerpoint this is kind of the next big thing all right <clears throat> hazards um <clears throat> so the green that's supposed to be a devil's dyke green on the left there so the red area are the trees um if you're thinking of doing the trudy run you need to cross by going you need to be over the top of those that clump of bushes on the corner if you're not going to get over the top of it um and you know you're above you're above this lower path before you get to it just turn come back to the bowl see if you can get some more height give it another go so you're kind of going to do this and bring it up um you're you've come around the bowl you've got here if you sort of plenty of height great just carry on if you're kind of scratching around the bowl and you get sort of you're getting to around here and it's like you think okay i'm not going to clear those bushes you've still got time here to actually put a turn in and get back to the bowl again um <clears throat> and you can also if that's not quite working you don't think you can make it it's you can top land in this area it's 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 a fairly safe area of top land um don't let's say if you are though trying to go for this you're coming along here and you you you, you can you're dropping below the tree line this bush line don't turn back because you're not going to make it again it's the what route you're going to take well we're going to head out to the landing field again um so the bait you know basically essentially if you're getting low around this set of bushes on the corner then just head to the landing field it, that's your safe option but what, we're, what we're aiming to do is for your very first sort of is from here is is getting up high come over the top um you come around here and now now you come to your next obstacle which is the pylons um these run down this hill and um there i think the first time you come across them, they're quite daunting because you see beneath you a set of pylons a set of cables with um which you know are carrying you know uh electricity and stuff um and my advice is the very first time you try and do the tree run just have plenty of clearance make sure you're minimally 100 feet above those and you won't have any problems at all um you know you, you don't mess around with power lines basically one of the other things you will find and i don't quite know why um which someone will probably explain to you one day when you've got power lines and you go over the top they inevitably create lift it's really bizarre i don't know what it is about them but a number of times you'll be going there you've got a little bit of height 
and you'll hit they, they trigger thermals um and you'll get a whole chunk more height over them enough to carry on your truly run the um <clears throat> once you've gone past that you're basically going to carry on just literally following the ridge um and it's a pretty straightforward run to be honest when you get to here you it goes up you actually gain a height at truly so it's usually what you'll find is you've got an increase in height here you gain some height so for the return leg you're generally higher than the outward leg um if that's the case you've got an easy run back again if you're coming back and you don't think you can clear the power lines then land before you get to them um and simply walk past them and if maybe just walk away just if you can't relaunch anywhere here just walk all the way back to the bottom um it's only a few minutes away all right uh so flip back to the powerpoint <clears throat> so one of the things i just want to split to right next <clears throat> and just and go over is is the sea breeze um and how it affects the devil's dike realistically between now and february it won't affect devil's dike but i want to i kind of want to explain what occurred a couple of weeks ago why people were getting into trouble and why it's so dangerous to play around with the sea breeze um so first of all it's a little bit of, of met uh so basics of basics of pressure and stuff <clears throat> On the diagram here, you'll see you've got we've got the red lines going up, got the blue lines coming down. So, where you have rising air, you get low pressure. The air is going up, pressure goes down. That rising air will eventually sink um, as it rises. It cools. Cool air sinks. You get descending air. Descending air, which is the blue line shown here, give you high pressure. So we've got warm rising air for low pressure. We've got cool descending air for high pressure. And the basic rule of the physics on this is that in order to balance out the pressures, air will move from high pressure to low pressure. Um, and that's the basis of how wind gets generated. You have different areas of pressure. And the wind moves from high pressure areas to low pressure. Um, you know, if you're looking at weather maps, synoptic charts, things like that, you can see it happening. Um, other basics, which is the uh, for low pressure, uh, as it says the air will spiral upwards uh, anti-clockwise at low levels, and for high pressure as it descends, it goes clockwise at low levels. Um, so we've got that basic principle that high pressure moves to low. So, so what is sea breeze? Um, so sea breeze is uh, is the, as a technical phenomenon. Uh, some of the people like the wind because the winds coming from the southwest. They say it's a sea breeze. That that doesn't make it a sea breeze. Um, a sea breeze is a phenomena generated by the sun heating. The land. So, a typical so a typical day at the dike. Sun's out. It's hot. So the, the all the land is being heated. Land's being heated. We get thermals. Thermals mean the air is going up. So, out in front of the dike, we've got this. We've got low pressure. We've got rising air. <clears throat> that rising air goes up, pushes out, and because of our proximity to the coastline, that's going to descend over the sea. Um, so you get high pressure building over the sea. So this is generated. It's, it's a local effect generated by the sun heating the ground. That heats up much faster than the sea does. So you've got warm, hot land, cooler sea. So you get this phenomenon of rising air over the land, 
goes over, descends over the sea, high pressure. So we've now got low pressure on the land, high pressure over the sea. So this will drive a wind, a sea breeze from the sea to the land. Um, and depending on the intensity of the sun, et cetera, it, it, will, it will vary in strength. Um, you know, so the, the strength of the sea breeze is dependent on the difference in pressure. The, the greater the difference in pressure, the greater the breeze, because it will generate a stronger wind. <clears throat> so from our perspective, um, let's bring up, actually I'll probably show on this better. If I just clear that, seconds. So basically we've got, Sea breeze is going to be building and coming in from this side. <clears throat> what it's going to run up against is we've got our wind blowing from this side. So we've got the wind blowing onto the hill. Behind it, the sea breeze is building up. And it all it, it, it's not a it's not a very it's not a distinct line it will move you know the, the met wind picks up the sea breeze picks up the met wind picks up the sea breeze picks up so you get this backwards and forwards thing of it as the sea breeze builds more and more as the pressure builds it pushes more inland and so we'll get to a point where you know as long as the sea breeze front is sort of back here somewhere they're not overly concerned because we're, we're very distinctly in the Met wind. But what we are concerned about is as it approaches and it gets to this sort of this area. Because <clears throat> when it's here, it's now it's going to encroach. It's going to come over the back a bit, go the other way, come over the back, back off. And this is what was happening a few weeks ago. The sea breeze was coming in, um, aided by the fact that we the wind wasn't northwest it was already west northwest so there was a tendency for it to already be driving the sea air to some degree along um and the other thing you get as which is what pilots play with which is where it gets really dangerous so this you've got a bit of convergence here so the sea breeze is pushing in met wind is here You've got two air masses meeting. You've got the colder sea breeze sort of pushing in it. It, it will create this convergence, which will give you this band of lifting air. Um, and some pilots, what you'll find is they'll they'll try and use that to get away. In. It is insanely dangerous. Not that you can't do it. It just requires a high level of skill. And if it goes wrong, it goes really badly wrong. Um, so it's a very high risk factor. And what happened on this day was the sea breeze, you could see it coming in. It was, we, you could actually see the wings in the bowl actually go south, go southwest. And then it backed off. And just as it backed off, a bit of convergence came through. And what happened from the main, on the main takeoff, for a second, because um, they were slightly away from the sea breeze, they had this bit of convergence. So they launched and actually got lift. There were pilots in the bowl who could see that, could see them going up. First one launched, and he actually launched. He was slightly ahead of the sea breeze. He got away, and he was on a faster wing. The pilot behind, seeing that, just went, okay, I'm going as well. Um, and it was just too late. By the time he launched, the the sea breeze had now moved in. So the air was now coming over the back and he just basically got drilled. Essentially took off. He got the, he got the edge of the convergence that started to go up and then immediately got overtaken by the sea breeze, which just collapsed the wing and you're in air that you cannot fly in now. Um, it's kind of like you're in, an, you're in a situation that you cannot recover from that close to the ground uh, and you know if you're 50 feet above the ground and you can't and the air is just going down and you can't fly in it there is only one outcome which is you're going to crash uh, so it's 
um, you know, you, you, <laughs> all I can say is you don't mess about with the sea breeze. When you see the sea breeze coming in, um, you're either in the air and away from it, or you're not, and you pack up and go home. <laughs> it's like, it's just, those are your options. Um, uh, so <clears throat> does that, I mean, does that kind of explain more about what sea breeze is and what we do with it and or not, what not to do with it? Um, but the dike is very, it, because of its our proximity to the coast, its shape, um, because we're already flying in a northwesterly, the sea breeze has a tendency, I mean, if I can just clear this for a second and um, close this. <laughs> what we've got, um, okay. So, let's bring it back on. Okay. So, here you've got, um, let's just put a few things back in again. So, we've got the dike here. You're coming along, you've got truly over here. And then here, we have a valley, we have a river. And that river is in a valley. So one of the things that happens is um, air moves like a liquid. So when the sea breeze starts to come in, yes, it's yes, it's trying to come over the back here, and it might well get stopped. But it'll also be pushing down this valley. And now there's nothing to stop it. There, there, there is no there is no ridge here to stop it so it'll actually come it comes through the valley down here um so you've got this sea air coming through here and it's going to meet this little layer of met wind so the sea air is going to come through meet this and what then tends to happen is it then can't quite push through that so instead, it actually kind of curves around and runs along the bottom of the of the um, runs along the bottom of the valley here, the bottom of the sort of dike to truly run. The sea air is already starting to come in, so it's already starting to push under the met wind. <clears throat> so now, you, you, so essentially, before the sea breeze actually come over the back, you will actually see it going quite westerly, lower down. And you'll notice in the landing field, people going into land are no longer going northwest when they come into land. They've got to turn into this sea air. So, it, so before it even comes over the back, we're already being affected with it lower down. Um, and, and again, it, it's something you kind of, if you don't understand, you can go to land at the bottom and suddenly find the air direction. It's just not what you think it's going to be. You suddenly... It, it, the wind has gone very west, you're in quite turbulent sinking air, and you can have quite a rapid landing. Um, so you need to be prepared for that as well. So sea breeze is, it majorly affects us. Um, I say for now through till March, it probably won't affect us at all. The sun's just not high enough to heat and create that that phenomenon. Um, but that's, that, that's, I, you know, I, I, it's difficult to stress enough for our sites just how much that affects them. But anyway, that gives you an idea of the topology of it, how the air comes through, and how it affects things. Um, what I'll do, let me just stop sharing for a second. Um, so just on, just there's quite a bit of data there. Any any questions so far in terms of the site, sea breeze, what's happening, um, how the wind affects the site and stuff? Done such a good job explaining it. No one's got any questions. <laughs> okay, cool. Good. Uh, oh, hi, Jim. Yeah, hi, Zam. Um, you know when you've drawn at the very start the two green launch sites at Devil's yeah. Dyke? Yeah. I've, I'm a real, real novice. I've only launched from the one in front of the pub. Yeah. It is is the one round by the bowl? Because it's sort of, sometimes it seems quieter. Is it a harder launch site? Or are they both much muchness? Okay, so let's talk about the bowl again. Um, 
the other thing I didn't, hadn't mentioned about the bowl, the bowl is is a bowl. So you've got two ridges kind of meeting, which gives you a V-shape. A V-shape always gives you a bit of venture and accelerated wind. So quite often, um, if the wind is strong on the normal takeoff, it, it'll often be too strong in the bowl. You'll get some convergent, you'll get a, a bit of venture coming through there. Um, the, the problem with launching from the bowl is you kind of only have one direction to go, which is back towards the main launch. And it's if you're not, if you don't get height when you first take off, you, you don't you have very limited landing options. Um you know, you're 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 right on the ridge, you launch. If it's not working, you only really have the option of kind of it's not easy to abort a launch there, and you kind of have to go to the bottom. The main takeoff is bigger, it's wider. You know, if you sort of bring the wing up and you're running, it's not quite, you can just stop before you get to launch point, drop the wing down, walk back up and give it another go. You you, you get that to some degree in the bowl, but not as much. Um, so is it a better place to go? Uh, I think um, my brief answer would probably be no. I think it's a trickier launch. Um, okay. And it's one of the ones where also because most people are taking off from the main takeoff, you often get quite a bit of air traffic coming past. You've got, to, it's sometimes harder to time the launch. And say so that's also the point where people are doing their figure of eight turns to cross over there. They're coming down one side, looping, going back the other. So it can be very busy. Um, uh, you'll often notice the bowl is like the busiest area because A, it's a little bit stronger. People aren't getting lift. They'll go there to get lift. B, it's where everyone's turning. Um, so launching from there has the extra hazard of more pilots. Not quite such an easy launch. Um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm not saying it's, but it, it's it, it's a bit trickier. That's all. Yeah, I think I'll stick to the other one. <laughs> yeah, just to get used to it. I'm not. I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't launch, but. The, the point of this is to answer questions like that and, and kind of point out things that, um, you know, as to why it's a trickier one to launch from. It's, you know, Robin, perhaps yeah. Like, Thank you. There. You'll see pilots launching from the bowl, but I don't think many of them actually walk to the bowl, bowl to launch. They launch at the main takeoff, come down slope land around the bowl, would you agree with that, John? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only time I've launched from the bowl is where it's a little bit too light on the main takeoff and it will be a bit stronger in the bowl. But that's like, you know, you're not going to get much fun because it's not that strong. You know? you're, you're limited. You're literally just going to be buzzing around in the bowl. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're not good at, uh, at fairly fast, to fast, smooth turns, it's not a good place to be doing very short beats you know in that sort of 50 meters of back and forwards over the ball um but uh but yeah but yeah i think yeah majority of us we we, we launched we launched from there because we landed there we can't be bothered to walk back so we're trying to make the best of it <laughs> ah, that's great thank you thank you for that yeah no problem at all all right cool um all right otherwise no other questions on that you're happy about sort of sea breeze and what it is and why we don't fly in it and uh okay all right good um so let's look at uh let's look at the next bit of this the <clears throat> so what we're looking at is, is progressing your flying at the dive um and so we're trying to get you to sort of like more more this sort of oh yeah sorry, more this you can't let me share my screen again sorry saying this you don't know what i'm looking at give me one sec back to share a screen screen share okay <clears throat> so this is kind of what we're aiming for is this progression of getting a bit of height um so it is, this is this is pretty much directly above takeoff you can see the whole ridge run um and one of the things as soon as you get a little bit of height everything changes because you're no longer skirting around a bowl you're no longer scratching you know, near an edge of something, you're above it. 
Um, and it 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 kind of changes the dynamics of your flying. Um, you know, if we compare this to this is these are sort of real shots of uh, this is your this is kind of like your normal soaring picture. Um, so we've got you've taken off. You're you're only just about above the height ridge height. Uh, as you can see in this, just about there's like there's quite a few pilots in the bowl. Um, we've got someone who who's not quite made it is it's getting low heading over the trees um this is kind of a typical basic soaring day where you're not getting that much height you've got to really work on your flying you keep making the decision am i going to top land i think i'll make it um and what we're aiming for is to get you from this to something a bit more like this where you've got some height you've got space to play with um so what I'm trying to do is go over, not getting overly complex, there's a few basic things on how to transition from this sort of flying to this sort of flying. Um, obviously, to, to get to this, you require thermals. And uh, fortunately, in the club, you'll always see, if, if there are thermals, they'll get marked, because there'll be pilots going up in them. But from your own your own point of view, how 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 do you make that transition? How do you get away? How do you get away from this up and down? Uh, I think it's safe to say that it's without a vario, it's very tricky. Fundamentally, what you're looking for as you fly along this ridge is you're looking for lifting air. You're looking for your various and going boo, and if it's uh, you know, a reasonably strong lift. Basically, what you're going to do, I'll just bring up Google Earth again so I can draw a couple of lines. Feel yeah, that. Zoom in a bit. So I should position. John, it's Robin yeah. again. There's a question on the chat from Andrew Lee who says, yep. I think this will end up being dealt with in what you're about to get to, but he says, are the good flights like the truly run to the east? I think the answer is they're not ridge soaring flights, they're cross country flights. Um, so do you mean past truly to the east or to truly? No, um, in the opposite direction from the main dike. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So let's, um, I'll just finish this point and I'll take that point up. I haven't looked at the east side, um, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely look at that. So, Basically, um, bring up the uh, little ruler, uh, ruler again. <clears throat> so a lot of your flying is is this, you know, is this sort of uh, oops, I keep my pattern in. Round is this ridge soaring pattern that you're doing? I mean, trying to you try and break away from that. Um, so you can either just wait until it gets until you kind of accidentally go up because the wind's getting stronger. Uh, or the lift's getting stronger, not the wind, sorry. Or what will you can do this. You're coming along and you'll you're, you're find you're getting this batch of lift somewhere. Um, and the first sort of playing around you can do is when that happens, is you're going up, is go with it, is actually push away from the hill. Just follow, follow that lift down. See if, it's, see if it still goes up. You'll tend to find that this lift here is is usually being generated by it's not 100, percent um, but there's something going up sort of in this area. So when you push away from the hill, you'll actually find you've got this band, little foot like a thermal of some sort going out up in front of the hill. The, 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 you know things can tend to get triggered. That, that's usually where the lift is occurring. It's not directly above it; it's in front of it. So you just basically have to make this decision that, okay, I've got some lift and obviously check that you can turn away without flying into people. You've checked, you've looked around, you've checked it's clear, you push away from the hill. Um, now, if it works, great, you'll find lifting air. If it doesn't, um, you should be able to come back and join things. If not, go and bottom land and then come back up and give it another go. Um, but this is your first sort of foray away from the hill and you'll see all the more experienced pilots just doing exactly this. You'll notice that they don't just stick in the ridge lift. They'll, they'll, they keep pushing out. 
or we do. You know, we'll push away from the hills, we push away from the hill. We're looking for something, we're looking for lift. Um, and again, using the barrier, we'll push out, barrier is still beeping, great. Okay, so we'll turn in it now. Um, and I, I'm not, I won't go, I don't get too technical about it, but yeah, one of the things you, you, you obviously have to master and get used to is 360s. Um, you know, if you can't turn, you're not going to be out of thermal because thermal requires you turning. Um, if you're not happy about doing 360s, uh, then, you know, speak to Robin, speak to myself, speak to the coach on the hill, we'll go over it with you. Um, but the, the kind of the basics of, I just don't, don't want to make it a talk on 360s, but the real fundamentals are that to get your wing to turn efficiently, always weight shift before you apply any brake. Um, it's like if you if you brake and then the amount of brake you have to put on if you don't weight shift is you, you kind of risk stalling your wing. If you weight shift extremely, you'll find you need minimal brake to actually turn and your turns will be quicker. So weight shift followed by a bit of brake will give you fast turns. Brake with no weight shift uh, is just dangerous, to be honest. Um, you know, you risk stalling one side of the wing. So if you haven't, if you, you know, if you haven't practiced turns, um, first thing rather than worrying about turn, just practice like weight shift, just extreme weight shift, and just notice that your wing, that you, you're starting to turn in circles. Add a little bit of brake, and you'll turn safely. Um, the problem with if you don't weight shift and you just apply lots of brake is you can spin the wing, and um, which is obviously very dangerous. But say if you're not happy with that, talk to myself, talk to Robin, talk to another coach. We'll go over it with you on the hill, and we'll explain it a lot more. But fundamentally, what you're going to be doing is this: is breaking. You, you've got to break this pattern of just soaring, and you've got to be willing to push away from the hill when you feel there's some lift there. Um, or if you see a whole bunch of people going up, um, that's like that's a, that's a kind of good giveaway. And usually that means it's quite lifty. And no matter how bad your thermaling is, you'll go up with them. Um, so that that's kind of in terms of the real basics of how you go. It, that's it. it. It really isn't any more complex than that for your, for your initial sort of um, getting going. Um, you know, you can we can talk about thermaling everything you like, but you have to be prepared to push away from the hill to get into lift to be able to thermal. So your your, your tension initially is just this breaking this habit of, um, you know, breaking this sort of this habit to doing ah lift. I'm going to push away. Um, once you start doing that, you can then think about thermaling because also. What you're doing by getting away from the hill is, you know, when you're when you're soaring, you may, you know, if if, if you're 50, 100 feet above the hill here, if you push out over here, you're suddenly four to five hundred feet above the ground. Because you 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 know, hopefully you haven't lost too much height, the ground is dropping away. Now you've got space to thermal. You can now do your turns. You, 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 you don't risk colliding with something. You're not going to, you know, if, if it turns a bit, if it's a bit low on one of the things, you're not going to hit the ground. Um, you know, the, the last place to be kind of putting your initial turn, like trying to practice thermally, is, is here. Sorry, let's get rid of that. Uh, you know, is in this area. Um, if this goes wrong and you're not getting a height on one of these turns, you're you're just going to plow into the ground. Um, that's what <laughs> that's what happens. If you're away from that and you've got five or six hundred feet beneath you in the ground, you can thermal. You can you can practice your turns. You've got space to do it. So don't be afraid to push away from the hill. Um, you'll find you know like the really good pilots, they, they don't care. They don't care if they bottom land. They'll just walk back up again. But they'll give it a go. They'll push out. They'll go look for something, and that's probably like the, one of the key things you have to learn is this: how do I get away from the hill? It's well, you get away from the hill. You just fly away from it. Um, and it, it's anyway that that's kind of what you have to learn to do. Um, so Andrew's question: I've talked about the truly one is 
I mentioned the tree run first simply because um, it is ridge soaring, uh, but it, it's a great it, it's a great run to do. Um, you do need a bit more north in the wind. If it, if it's if the wind is like strongly northward, it's tricky because once you come around the corner, you tend to be um, I say the corner. Let me bring this back up again. Once you get past this point, when the wind's northwesterly, you're very much sort of into wind coming this way. So it, it can be quite tough. When the wind is more northerly, because of the way the ridge, um, the direction of the ridge changes, this ridge is actually quite into wind. So it actually works very well. Um, so the northerly, the truly run becomes a nice run to do. And what you'll actually find is all the way along this ridge in those cases, uh, there are lots of triggers for, um, you'll find lots of thermal triggers along there. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's quite easy to get height. Um, yeah. And again, if it's not working, you've got this whole area for bottom landing. It's a very safe ridge run to do once you get past the pylons. Um, Okay, is that uh, so? Before I go on to the, Andrew's question, um, <clears throat> any any question, uh, anything on that, like getting away from that, anything you want to know about getting away from the hill, how to do it, um, anything at all? Uh, hi, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry to hear. Yeah, uh, I was wondering. So, when you do the th the turn. And you're on the on the side of the turn that is with the back wind. Uh, yep. Right. So that that's when things accelerate and your turn becomes less of a circle, but of a uh, something else, right? Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have regarding that, or how to keep the the circle as well circle as possible? Okay. So that a couple makes, of things that on makes that. Sense. Yeah. No. Absolutely. First of all. Um, because we're flying in wind, it's very rare the thermal goes straight up. Um, you know, you've got a, you've got this column rising air in the wind. It's going to drift with the wind as well. So, um, yeah. So if so, when you're thermaling, you will get you would expect, but you you don't expect to go. It's very rare you go straight up. I mean, it's very rare. You would expect to track to some degree with it, and one of the things you will one of the things you will find when you first start thermaling is this phenomenon where winds are going this way, thermals going, where you because you're not quite used to tightening up on that back turn, the tendency is to fall out the back of the thermal. Um, so that's that will happen. <laughs> yeah, when you first start thermaling, you'll get in a thermal and you'll it'll be where did my thermal go? Yeah, and it is on that downwind leg, which is what I think what you're talking about because now you're accelerating through it. You haven't quite put enough turn in, and you 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 pop out the back of it, um, and it's actually often quite difficult to get back into it when that happens, because obviously thermal's coming up here at the back of it. It's usually slightly turbulent, but sinking air. You hit into it, you drop, and now you're trying to get back into this column, um, and it can be frustratingly annoying that you can't do it. Uh, so. But that uh, comes with a lot of practice. Um, so the first thing is this thing, push away, start getting your turns in and watch other pilots, watch how they're turning, how they're going up. And what you, you know, and usually there's, if there's a group of pilots and you're above the dike and there's space, you, you can get in the bottom and just follow their path. Like just try and keep track with what they're doing. You'll learn what the, the size of the turn is. Um, it does vary because thermals aren't the same width. Some are narrow, some are wide. Some are, sorry, narrow, wide. Um, they don't stay the same width as you've got. I mean, they're not they're not a constant thing by any means. Um, so you'll often hear this term like mapping a the thermal. And it's just uh, as you fly in it, you're trying to get an idea of where are the edges of it, where's the core, um, where's it going up fastest, how can I stay in that, things like that. So th there's, uh, I think, um, 
Ted is going to do a talk on January, February, I think, about purely about thermaling, and he'll cover a lot more of that, and it'll just be for sort of thermal season kicks off. For now, um, we'll get odd days where it'll be slightly thermic, but just practice this pushing, get used to pushing away, leaving the ridge, pushing out. Um, that really is your sort of starting point for getting getting away from the hill. Uh, that's what will get you going on it. Um, Ted's talk is due in January. And January, okay. It's due to be videoed again. I also posted a talk by Brett Janaway, which I think is a very good, simple explanation of yes. thermaling. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's very good. And that'll give you like a more in-depth understanding of it. Um, hey, I'm just gonna start it clear for seconds, come out a bit. So going, oops, sorry, close that. All right, so the classic Devil's Dyke cross country. Well, the first sort of cross country you're likely to do. Um, it's with a sun and light northwesterly type wind. So let me put this back on again. Generally, for most people, their first sort of XC is so you're starting off from here with the dike. Um, you're going to push out, you're going to get some sort of thermal activity. You're going to get up and it's going to take you generally in this direction. Um, John, and, it might just be me, but I can't see any. Oh, ah, that's because I forgot to share the screen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry. I get carried away. I'm like, oh, look at this. Look at this. Oh, what's he talking about? I have no clue. Let me <laughs> share the screen again. No, no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please feel free to point out my uh, emissions. Um, okay. Now you can see the screen. I'm going to clear this and start again. Right. Now you can see it. So you've got Devil's Dyke here. This is where you're going to start. Um, we're in Northwesterly, so you're going to, somewhere around here, you're going to find, probably push out a little bit, and you're going to get your sort of first thermal activity, and it's going to, it's going to take you up. And it's going to start drifting you over the back. Um, there might be several of these. You might have this, you know, push forward a bit, find another thermal push out this way. I mean, usually there's a bit of messing about so you kind of get a bit of height and get more established. But the general drift is going to take you this way. And the, the kind of the first XE for most people is towards here. It, it's this, it's towards Falmer. It's towards the, um, uh, the Amex Stadium. Um, and It'll, normally you, you might somewhere between Devil's Dyke and the Amex Stadium, you'll will tend to be where you get to on your <laughs> you, you might get as far as the Ditchley Road, you might get a bit to Stamda, you might get a little bit further, um, you might get past that towards like the Wood Indian area. That's probably that's probably realistically a good like a it's like a one thermal. You know, you, you've got up in your first thermal, you've not really managed to find anything else, you've gone on a downwind glide, and that's enough to take you 10 to 15, 10k away from the hill. Um, and that's not an atypical first cross-country flight. Uh, it's you're away from the hill, you've got a thermal, you haven't found the second one, and you just you've just basically gone downwind until you've landed. Um, nothing wrong with that at all. It's a great experience. Um <clears throat> But the more sort of the route people, what we, I guess the, the what we're trying to do on a cross country, um, is more like this. Essentially, we're Devil's Dyke, and we're going to get up, and we're going to try and push forward a bit into wind, and if possible get on to this Ditchling Ridge. Um, because this works really well. And then from here, we're looking for lift and kind of heading towards Lewis. And from Lewis, I'll just zoom out again. You're kind of um, okay. This again. So, um, yeah, we'll just bridge. So, I'm going to use this. Let's get to the standing. 
All right, so Devil's Dyke's around here somewhere. And we've headed along here towards Lewis, Ringma. Uh, very often then we try and push towards, trying to stay inland, push towards Heathfield, out towards Roberts Bridge, and then keep going. Um, that's, uh, I guess the other one that's fairly typical is where you don't push inland and from here. The other one that's really common is nice to do. It's about 50k. It's from here. You ring Ma. You kind of can't quite push in. You're going, wind's gone a bit more westerly. And you head here towards back and you end up near battle. Um, that's kind of a, another fairly uh, standard flight that people do. Um, the great thing about that, so this sort of direction, is there's lots of buses, there's lots of trains. It's pretty straightforward to get back to the dike. Um, but all of this requires, you're not going to do this on one climb. Um, so this is where, before you even kind of think about, oh, can I get there? Can I get to battle? Can I do any of these things? What we're looking at uh, is, let's go back to the dike itself. How far off was I? Um, oops. Right. So I'll stress this again. What you're looking at here, and this you can practice, is, is this soaring push out. Find some lift. See if you can get a bit of a climb, even if it's a small one. Runs out, come back to the hill, more soaring, bit of lift, push out. See, see if you can find a bit of a climb again. And then you're kind of emulating a cross-country flight where you're you found some lift, you've lost it. You've carried on flying, you found some more lift. You've used it, you've lost it. And you'll get this, so you get this thing, climb, push, some sink, find lift, climb, push, sink. And you can emulate it um, by pushing away from the hill. Um, and, it, and it's just, and that you can do in winter. We'll get, we'll get days in winter where you're not gonna go cross country, but, <clears throat> We might get decent days where you get climbs to, you know, a thousand, one and a half, two thousand feet above takeoff. Um, great for practicing things like this. They really are, and uh, it, it's going to it's going to give you that confidence to leave the hill. Um, anyway, kind of veering a bit from the site guide here. So, just to go back briefly to, um, sorry, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah. Um, right. So terms of the site guys, do any any questions about Devil's Dyke itself, flying it, your concerns about it, things you're not sure about? Um, no. Okay. Good. Um, I've got. Just going to cover one last thing. To the PowerPoint. Yeah. So that's, this is what it's like, basically clouds. Um, what you will find uh, when you fly and you start to get high is what we're aiming for cloud base. Um, I won't do, a, I don't want to go into too much detail, but what we don't do is actually go into clouds. Um, uh, and if you, uh, to be honest, I'm probably not, I think, I think I'm going a bit off topic here, so I'm, I'm actually not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, let's, let, let's assume this, the point where you, this is a problem, <laughs> we'll deal with that next year for you. I think for now, the thing to concentrate on is this willingness to leave the hill. Um, you'll never go cross country if, if, you, if you don't break that getting away from the hill phenomena. Um, and it's just, you, you just have to be willing to get to that point where you don't turn and run back to the hill. Once you once you achieve that, cross country becomes just the next the next stepping stone, um, and and, it, and don't worry about how far it is. You know, say seven k, ten k, whatever. It, it's all across. You've left the hill. It's a cross country flight, and once you do it, it will change your attitude towards flying completely. Um, okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing the screen for a second. Yeah. Yes. 
sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, no, feel free. Just so I'm checking my understanding. Do we need to have our full pilot rating before we think about okay. prosecuting? Okay, very good question. Um, as a pilot rated, uh, as a pilot rated pilot, you, okay, why do we do pilot rating? One of the key components of pilot rating is airspace. Um, the big concern about cross country is you understand airspace. Um, what we don't want is people violating it. A, it's insanely dangerous. B, we do not want to get the CAA involved in any of our flying. We do that by avoiding airspace. So as um, someone who's passed the pilot exam, you've, you've studied airspace, you're kind of basically saying and attesting that you understand airspace and are not going to violate it. Um, as a CP, you haven't done that. So for club pilots who want to go XC, the requirement is that you're kind of that you're supervised by a coach. What that means is that you've discussed your XC flight with a coach. Um, you understand airspace. You understand the airspace you like to be going into, and you have a means of you. You must have a means of monitoring the airspace. You must have something on an instrument that tells you whether you're approaching it, um, how close you are to it, whether you're in it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can, as a club pilot, go cross country. Um, that's one of the great things about the BCC Challenge, the British Clubs Challenge. Um, that's designed for CPs and they all fly cross country. The way they work that is you get a complete brief safety briefing at the beginning, which goes over which route you're gonna fly, airspace, um, how to handle it. And, and then you're free to go flying. Um, so it's, uh, as long as you've kind of discussed it with a coach, so let's, let's go cross country flying. Okay, we're going in this direction. Okay, do you understand airspace? Yes, great. Go for it. You're fine. Um, Generally you speaking, John, okay, yeah. the Southern Club sites and area are not heavily regulated by airspace. Devil's Dyke's got a ceiling of five and a half grand, four and a half grand just out in front of it. And the route that John showed out towards Heathfield. Yes, you get into lower airspace, um, but there's really not much out there until you start getting close to Headcorn Aerodrome. Otherwise, we've yeah. got Shoreham airfields uh, and not much else to be worried about. Yeah, um, I, 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 the only caveat I put on that is, and I, I've seen it happen, um, on a good day, like a good day, you, you, you will get to four and a half, five grand. Um, and if you're not if you're not prepared for it and you don't have the instruments for it, you can end up in airspace. I've I've seen it happen. Um, so yes, from now through from now through to March, the likelihood of you violating airspace by going on a cross country from the dike is almost zero. Um, we're not going to get we're not going to get lifts to four and a half grand. That just isn't going to happen. Um, so the biggest problem is altitude rather than coordinates. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, if you get a reasonably good day and you're, you're up to about a grand, grand and a half, and you think, oh, let's give it a go, give it a go. Um, you know, it, no one's going to lock you up in a cell and throw away the key because you landed, didn't land back at the landing field. Um, and also technically, what is a cross country? You know, if you do the truly run and you land in a field, is that a cross country flight? You haven't landed in the official landing. Technically, you're on a cross country flight. Um, no one's going to moan about it or complain about it. You're not you're nowhere near like violating airspace uh, i'd say the the real concern for the bhpa about people just doing cross country you're not pilot rated is airspace violations um and we have very few of them uh, uh well part of the reason we have very few is when they happen nobody publishes their flights because they, they won't let anybody publish them <laughs> so they happen occasionally but when they do you don't hear about it because we don't publish the flights between um, one or two instances, I think more paramotors than paragliders of people uh, overflying Brighton seafront and landing there yes. and doing yeah. unnecessary things. And in those sort of cases, which are very visible, the police will knock on the door. Yeah, but weirdly, that's more 
a lot of that isn't to do with violating airspace. A lot more of that is to do with um, just violating basic air law about flying within yeah. so many feet of a public over a crowd or a, over a crowd, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so uh, what I would say is, look, between now and spring, practice, practice, just practice leaving the hill, leaving the hill, whenever you can. Get into that frame of mind. Once we hit spring, once we hit March, we get cross country conditions. They start in March. They we get brilliant XC conditions in March. You'll be ready for it. Um, but yes, and between now and then, you've got plenty of time to get your pilot exam done. <laughs> then you don't have to worry about it. Um, so that, which is what we encourage people to do. You know, it's like that. Get your pilot exam done. It's not an issue. But if you haven't got it done, and it's a nice cross country day. Speak to a coach. Go over it. Do your cross country flight. Uh, I had a question, John, if you for me. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the condition of flying the dike. Uh, the forecast for Saturday seems to be I mean, it's quite a chilly day. Winds ten to twenty miles an hour. Yeah. And going westerly. Top end. Is that a good thing or not? Um. Okay. At uh, this point, let me let me just stop sharing the screen for a second. What I would say on that is um, monitor every day. What, what's happening right now is we've been dominated by these south southwesterly air mass. Um, that's changing. So we're now getting the northwesterlies coming through. And we're going to get, they'll be heralded by, a, I think we're due to get a bunch of rain tomorrow and Friday. Um, and then we're going to get this traditional thing, you know, the front will come through and we get these northwesterlies. They're looking very top end at the moment. That doesn't mean they will be top end all weekend, but they are looking that way. Um, but there's been a bit of discussion on the coaching group and other places about top end flying. My view is that if it's too strong to launch, you know, and you need some sort of assisted launch, you shouldn't be launching. It's too strong to fly. There is, uh, I'm sure some people will argue that that is, but from my point of view, if the wind is blowing at trim speed, i.e. as fast as your wing will go without applying speed bar, you're not going anywhere. So we get this phenomenon called gale hanging. Um, and it just means you're pinned. You're, you're, you'll be above the ridge, just sitting there. Um, that's your idea of entertainment. That's your idea of entertainment. The liabilities of this are an extreme lack of maneuverability is one of them. You can't, you can't just go where you want to go. You're stuck. Every time you turn, you get blown a bit further back. If you're flying in those conditions, I, I, actually, let's, no, let's phrase this. Let's assume you're not flying in those conditions. Let's take this scenario. You, you launch, it's, it's not, it's getting strong, but it's not top end. You, you make, you can push forward. You're in the air, the wind starts to pick up. Now, your ground speed is getting to zero. Um, one of the things when you, when the wind is a little bit strong, is um, particularly somewhere like, well, anywhere actually, but the dike, because of some of the hazards of where you land, you always want to check your penetration. Every now and then, just point into wind and see how you're going forward or not. Um, if you're getting to the point where without speed, without bar on, you're, you're starting to not go forward, land. Don't wait until you can't go forward um, because you're getting to a point where the only direction you're going to go is backwards. Um, and you know, landing backwards is not entertaining. It's very dangerous. Um, you're also in a situation where you think, well, if you just turn and run for them, you, you're now going to have a phenomenal, your downwind speed is just phenomenal. You, you're going to break something. Um, so it's the, the, the hazard of flying in wind, which is picking up in strength, is that if it continues to pick up in strength, you're, you're basically screwed. Um, you're not going forward. You've got to somehow come down. If you if you come down too close to the ridge, the, the layer of turbulence, because the wind is stronger, goes further back. So you risk hitting turbulent air on the way down. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, oh, actually, yeah, I mean, so hazards. So I'm talking do it, hazards. Will. Don't do it. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, how do I practice more strong wind launch? It's like, well, uh, you don't want to launch in conditions that you 
really shouldn't be flying in. Um, I understand people get desperate to fly, they want airtime, but we also want you around for the next season, um, not spread across the ground, basically be blunt. Um, so, what uh, you can find though is that the wind, for example, 500 feet up at the top of Mount Caban may be considerably stronger than it is in the landing field. And you yeah. may be safe ground handling in the landing field without taking your wing up to the top of the hill. Yes, that, that's a ground handling low down. That's the entire thing um, compared to ground handling on top of the hill where you're going to take off from. <laughs> I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the diet. I'm not saying don't go take a look because it might drop. The forecast might be wrong. It, they might, the conditions might actually be okay. What I'm saying is don't mess about with strong wind um, because you, you, you're narrowing down what you can do. Um, and that has reminded me, I forgot about one of the major hazards at Devil's Dyke, which I'm just going to bring up. Sorry, I completely forgot about that's it. That's what I was asking, maybe, yes. At least there's a pub there, so. Yeah, that's the major hazard I'm about to bring up. All right. Okay. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. Sorry about this. I completely, totally forgot about it. Uh, let's go back to Google Earth. And uh, let's just... Okay, so what do we have? That's quite a good view, actually. What do we have right behind launch? So you've got launch. Um, and it's going to bring up this little thing. Right. So we've got, we're generally taking off from here. What do we have right behind that? Um, yes, you've got these trees. And what do we have behind that? Here we have the dike itself. So this this V section in the ground behind the trees is Devil's Dike. Um, for those who don't know, um, it's the hoof print left by the devil many, many years ago. Hence, Devil's Dike. Um, this is, if you are soaring anywhere in this sort of area above the trees and the wind is getting strong, this is like lethal. This is insanely dangerous place to be. Um, because if you go back, the tendency is, and you get any sort of sink, if you're going to come into this area at all, you're going to have rotor, you're going to have horrendous collapses. It's like, it's like a really, 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 really bad place to be. Um, so with strong wind, so if it's picking up, then I'm just going to clear that for a second. Um, back up again. So if you found yourself in this sort of area and the wind is really picking up, and obviously you're higher, don't hang about. If you can't go forward, at least go this way to the side <clears throat> where you've got open space behind you. You do not have the Devil's Dyke behind you. You do not have a pub behind you. You do not have a mass of trees behind you. And you've got some, you've got some chance of being able to escape in that area. Um, so yeah, don't, you know, don't go when the wind gets strong, don't goof around about take on both. Well, maybe I'll come down and land there. Forget it. Just forget it. Ideally, try and eat your way forward and get down to the landing field. If you can't, at least go westerly away from the dike, away from the roads, away from the pub, and land over there somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, you've got space, if you get it wrong, you've got space to get dragged, you've got grass, you've got things that, as unpleasant as might be, is nowhere near as unpleasant as roads and trees and other and vehicles and things. Um, yeah, so that's, sorry, it's a major hazard, I completely forgot to mention it, it, it it's kind of crucial. Um, the other thing with strong winds is uh, if you are, if you get it, if you're, if, if you're at, if you're in this area of takeoff and the wind is picking up and you get it wrong, you're going in one direction, which is this direction. Um, you're heading straight for the car park, heading straight for the pub. And again, uh, I have. I mean, last year, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen people, I've seen someone, as funny as it sounds, bounce <laughs> off the burger van. Um, literally, just 
couldn't control the wing, got dragged, got lifted very slightly and smacked straight into the burger van. And that's what stopped him. Um, I see there was another pilot we had, this is going back about three years, who again launched, lost it, couldn't control it, actually got turned. Um, and as, as sort of uh, Carla would have it, I mean, he went, basically he got turned, he went face first straight, his knee went straight through a windscreen, just happened to be his own car. Um, so, okay, that's a slightly humorous side, but it's that dangerous. I mean, just like driven straight into the car park, straight through a vehicle. Um, it, it's when that wind picks up at that level and it whips over the top, and you can't handle, you don't know how to get, you don't know how to kill your wing rapidly. It's insanely dangerous. And that was a point I was trying to make in one of the forums the other day about, look, as much as you might want to practice how to launch in strong wind, practice first how to kill your wing in strong wind. Um, that's way more important than launching it, is how do you stop it? If you're in strong wind and it goes out of control, how do you kill that wing fast? Um, and that's what, you should have attention on uh, because, well, th that's why launching in strong wind is insanely dangerous. If it goes slightly wrong, you're just going to, you're going to get dragged into something without question. Um, you know, a lot of our sites are surrounded by barbed wire fences. A number of times we see people just drag into a barbed wire fence and, and your wing just gets shredded at that point. If it hits the fence, the barbed wire just goes, conveniently just slices it into lots of little bits. Um, there's a or lesson you. there, John, as to where in the uh, launching area to take off from. Because when you've got the wind on the slope, you've got Venturi effect, which means as you get closer to the pub and the wing above your head, the wind's effectively going to be stronger than if you move further forward down the hill. Yeah. And you've got more proximity to the cars. So you're putting yourself at unnecessary danger launching in stronger wind closer to the hazards so move forward and launch yeah so basically assuming that it's not completely top end but it's picked up then yes instead of launching here come down this yeah you know, you'll find a lot of pilots will launch be launching in this area um again you need to know that if you do successfully launch there that you've got enough trim speed to go forward. There is no point going down there, successfully launching to find that you do not have that trim speed. And all that's happening is you're going backwards um, because backwards is straight to the pub. And worse, if you clear the pub, straight to the dike. So um, be very wary, like strong, Launching in winds that are topper than your trim speed, it's it's highly, highly dangerous. I don't know how to put it. Um, um, we've got another question from Andrew yeah. who says, could you comment on top landing at Devil's Dive, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, top landing. Okay, so you've, you've done your flight. You want to come into top land. Um, so, again, the other hazard I haven't mentioned, because it's not entirely visible on here, Devil's Dyke, the most popular tourist, one of, not, probably one of the most popular tourist spots in the southeast of England. It's packed with people most of the time. And where are those people? Well, they tend to be quite a lot of them around this area. <laughs> um, so top landing. First thing is um, avoid people. If there are a lot of people and you feel you cannot easily avoid avoid them on a top landing, don't top land. Don't land there. Go and land somewhere else. And that really is my first thing is, you know, if you do not think you can safely land and avoid public, don't land there. So let's assume it's not an issue um, that public has seen as lots of lots of us about and they're, they, you know, they're kind of sticking to the path area. They're not in themselves a problem. So what do we have here? We have in the whole of this area where you are thinking of landing, we have pilots that are thinking of launching. Um, so another thing to watch out for when you look. So when you, from a launching point of view, 
look have a really really good look around make sure no one is coming into land um if someone is coming into land and your wings up put your wing down just get that hazard out of the way so let, let's assume though that for now no one's trying to launch the public aren't there you've basically got um an open area to come and land in so if we've got a uh Let's say we've almost got an ideal situation of uh, well, winds. Probably you, you, wind is usually a little bit off. So we, let's say we've got winds kind of coming in this sort of direction. This means that if you're approaching from the west, you're going to have a downwind element to your approach. So you'll be coming in fast, um, and a lot of people because they've been you know they, they tend to have been soaring here and they'll come in this way for an, a landing often end up coming in quite fast um the ideal place is to obviously approach from this from this side the main problem with that is that quite often people are, when they get to that side are too low to make that approach so what you're realistically going to try and do is probably come in from this side with enough height that you can act, if need be, you can actually put a bit of a turn in and land into wind if that's not possible then what you'll actually find is that the the ground is a, tends to talk, go upwards in this direction and if you're so from a from an approach point of view, what you can actually do is if you're coming along here, um, you will tend to find that as you come down, you're actually getting closer to the ground. You can over here put in a little turn and land. Um, the other thing that that's assuming you've got that height. Quite often, what will happen is. People, are, they've been soaring, they're getting low on their soaring, and that's why they want to land. So they don't have ton, they don't have tons of height up here. Instead, they're usually above the ridge here. So now they're in a situation where they're coming in quite low on the slope. Um, and very often, you're with a slight downwind element. Now, if you're this low, slope is going up you're approaching it it's a slightly technical landing what you're going to try and do is as you approach is kind of turn your wing slightly into wind so that you're not facing downwind you actually turn slightly and you're kind of sliding it almost like almost like crap what they call crabbing in so you now you know you've come off your downwind leg you put a little bit of not too much, a little bit of turning. So you're just starting to face a bit more back down the slope. So you've reduced your ground speed and now you can land. Um, but all of this is, <laughs> with all of this, you've got other pilots there. I mean, it's, so you, it, it does require a, a good level of judgment to actually top land in this area. Um, I don't. I don't think it's an easy place to top land um, at first because of the public, the pilots. Um, and the, the slope, but if it's not too busy and you've got enough height rather than coming in low above here. If your path is if you're coming in more above the footpath here, it's actually much easier because you can you can actually burn off then bit of height in this area and quite and fairly comfortably um trying to s this around so sort of come into land around here assuming you've got enough height i'd so, say that if you're trying to build up your experience in practice top landing furl and bow peak are a little easier because you haven't yes. got the same number of general public you probably haven't got this quite the same number of paragliders. Yeah, I, I think, as I say, I, so I think technically 
Um, uh, top landing at that area is quite tricky. Um, because it's one of the reasons that often people will land over here uh, on, in the bowl, partly because they start, it's sort of a more natural landing. You, you tend to be going this way slightly into wind anyway. And so it's, you're already going into wind, you, your ground speed is, is being reduced. You've got, a, you've got the ground going up away from you. And it, it's a fairly easy top landing. You're not putting any funny turns in. You're not essing at all. You, you could just come into land. Um, and that's in many ways simpler. And that's why often you'll see pilots landing there because it's actually easy to land there. And it is to negotiate the 50 other pilots in the bowl, the, the, the 200 public, um, the fences, all sorts of other things. So again, what I would suggest is you watch other pilots coming into land. If you still got questions, speak to a coach, go over it, discuss a landing path. Um, if you've got enough height to comfortably try that landing, give it a go. If you don't, then abort and either and push out or just you know continue soaring, go land at the bowl. Or just push out and land at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> don't put yourself at risk for the sake of not walking up. That's the other thing I would say. It's sometimes pilots get a bit desperate. They, they they decide at the end of the day they're a bit tired. They do not want to walk up from the bottom. They're going to force a top landing. That's when things go wrong because you're, it's the end of the day. You're a bit tired. You're not paying as much attention. Kind of desperate to top land. So you don't want to do that walk up. Um, and then you'll see lots of sketchy landings going on. Um, you know, quite a lot of time people get away with it. That's not the point. It would have been much, much safer just to land at the bottom, packed up, spent the 20 minutes walking up. So, so don't get tempted to force a top landing because you don't want to bottom land and walk up. Um, One it's point not about worth it. bottom landing, uh, last time I was there, which was 10 days ago or so, there's still an electric fence running uh, across the landing field, the bomb out field. Okay. And if the wind is coming west and you're landing across that field, you need to decide which side of that fence you're going to land. Yeah. Which is the other point on any site is site inspections because, you know, four weeks ago, I don't think the fence was there. It was two weeks ago. Um, the other thing about the dike that happens usually about November time is um, the electric fence appears usually about here. Oops, sorry. They fence this bit off with an electric fence um, and they dump animals in this side of it. So we get this added hazard in winter of an electric fence. It's only a low one. Um, but it is electrified. I've had pilots test it. Um, and it definitely does have electricity going through it. And it means, and cattle in that area. So uh, do watch out for that. Um, I've got another question on the chat, John, yep. from Loxton, who says, could you point out where the ground handling area is behind the hang glider takeoff, please? Yes, I can. Um, so basically it is, this section here. Uh, now that it can actually be very good when you have like a well, it's not too strong. You know, southwest it actually takes the southwesterly quite nicely. Um, you're not going to fly, but it's actually quite good for ground handling because of its direction. There's a bit of a slope running up. Um, it's yeah, it is an option to, to, to go and ground handle. The dike itself, the rest of it. Oh, well, it's a flyable day. There's nowhere really suitable to ground handle because pilots are launching and taking all along the, all along the area. Um, so it's not a great place to ground handle at all. Um, but if you if you you know if you're close to the dike, if that's the way, if it's a close site to you and it's southwesterly, not too top end. You want something to ground handle? It, it actually works very well. I've done ground handling there. It's a nice space and it's fairly clean airflow. 
and you can come to the grand handle there. Okay, cool. Right, um, let's just stop sharing again for a second. All right, good. Um, so I've kind of covered all the bits I want to cover. Um, if that, if you've got any final points you want to summing up, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, we've got the sort of very efficient sort of Redmond chat group. You can post questions in there and we'll get to answer them there. Um, otherwise, hopefully it's helped a bit and it's expanded on the sort of printed site guide and given you a bit more understanding of the site. Um, let's say, but if you have other things and you're at the site, ask. Please ask us as a coach when you're there. What's this? What's that? What happens here? What happens there? You know, we'd, we'd much rather you ask a question than you than you don't ask it and have an accident. <laughs> so, you know, never, never feel embarrassed or put off about asking questions. Um, we expect it. We want it. It's great. It's a, it's a perfect learning tool. Um, you know, we don't expect you to know everything. Um, I mean, like, it's, it's good to be challenged. It's great when people ask questions because you sometimes go, never thought of that. <laughs> Better figure it out. Um, anyway. All right, cool. So if no more questions, we'll wrap up there. Um, and then, um, yeah, if it's uh, if you find this a useful format, I say there's, I've already done one on Beach. I'll try and, I'll try and fit one in on the other sites. I think it'd be good to do one on New Haven especially for winter and cover that one. Um, it'll probably be, won't be for a while, but maybe sort of in a month's time or so, we'll, we'll do a New Haven one for winter and uh, go into it. Anyway, Jeremy, you, did you find us a useful format to look at it, discuss it and go through it? Yeah, okay, good, good. That's all it was I need really to helpful, John, thank you. No problem at all. All right, guys, well, thank you. I will, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's so fine. All right, guys. Thank you so much.